Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. This is Tim. Yep, and we're here to do part two of the July q and I think this is still... We've, we've just snuck in for having part two still in July, right? Uh, Ho- maybe. Yeah, let's, maybe. let's Part so. one, I think we did. Anyway, it's... Well, anyway, part one should be live on the channel, so make sure you go watch that before you watch this one. Or does it really matter? We asked... Watch the- this one and then go back and watch part one at the end. Yeah, it doesn't matter The questions much. aren't They're right. all random. Lots of good questions, yeah. though. And we asked the questions in July, so that's yeah, what counts. That is it doesn't what really matter when we got around to answering them. <laughs> yep. <so. laughs> all right, let's get into the second half of the questions. Question four. The God of HDR, Tim. <laughs> Got us up All there. All right, cool, <laughs> whatever. Can you explain what were those halos in Linus's video for the ASUS PG35VQ, I oh, get a short one, uh, that were presented at 8 minutes and 47 seconds? Was that real what FALD does? Uh, or so was, it, was that really what FALD does, sorry? If so, that's an option that no one should ever use. Uh, that's just horrible. I would rather have the entire screen lit up than see halos. Uh, please tell me I'm wrong, because I'm. if I'm not, then FLAD is just another gimmick and a lie to convince people to buy HDR when it's not ready. <sighs> All right, right so let's just give a pause. I'll go uh, watch the, assist, the, uh, the Linus video, okay. and I'll get back to you in just a moment. All right, I'll sit back and I'll have a... I'll finally get that Oreo that I wanted. Yep. Which is a perfect opportunity uh, to yep. have a look. Yep, 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 I get it. Yep. Okay. I've watched the video, I've watched that brief little bit there at 8.47. And so, is that what FLD does? The answer to that is yes, but I would say that it's that's not a problem. And the reason for that is, is that you're not really meant to use the FLD backlight, which is your local dimming array behind the mm-hmm. screen. You're really not meant to use that with static desktop content. And okay. the part of the video that Linus was showing was in just the Steam interface. So mm-hmm. obviously it's got like a big gray like background to it. When the backlight t- switches on and off, that's very noticeable because yep. you know it's changing the brightness. You can just easily see it on a static background. And generally speaking, HDR is not designed for desktop use. Mm-hmm. It, you don't use HDR and then open Steam and look at it. Like, there's no point. Yeah. What HDR is designed for is for things like your movies, TV shows, video content, in general, plus games. Mm -hmm. And in that content, it's all very dynamic. There's rarely going to be times where you see big static areas of just a single color or, like, the background of a wallpaper Mm -hmm. in Steam or something. that, That doesn't really happen. So while you do get that sort of haloing with an FALD backlight... In SDR content, if you have that enabled and things like desktop apps, you actually don't notice it at all in games or TV shows or movies, especially with the PG35VQ being a VA panel. So, yeah, it looks bad when you sort of show that worst case scenario in that particular video. In my video as well, I showed a similar thing and it looks kind of ugly, but you can just turn it off for your SDR content, leave it enabled for HDR where you get the real benefit of it, and yeah, like I said, you don't really notice. Um, definitely not a lie just to convince people to buy HDR right now. Top end LCD TVs use FALD as well and have really good HDR performance. Not as good as OLED, but very, very good. So same sort of thing with monitors. I don't think it's an issue for gaming. All right, next question here. Do you think the game optimizations for Ryzen based next gen consoles will give AMD PCs a performance advantage? Uh, yeah, I think. It probably will. It all depends on how the games are ported across to PC. Um, It'll help more than it did last gen because, mm. you know, it was while the last gen consoles did use AMD CPUs, they used their Jaguar yep. CPUs, which not very good. <laughs> this time around, they'll be having an actual decent CPU in there yep. that will be very equivalent to current higher desktop chips and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. We'll definitely be seeing some sort of advantage there, you'd think. I think the bigger thing for AMD would be the GPU um, sort of things going on there, like how they utilize Navi yeah. would be very there's, interesting as well. Well, there's even there's more crossover than there's ever been for them, so that can yeah. only be a good thing. All right, Steve. Is the RX 580 a good deal in 2019? Uh, yeah, I'd yeah. say it is. I checked earlier online and it was $170 US, or you could you could at least get a couple of models for yep. 170 and that makes them better value than the GTX 1660, 1660 Ti. Uh, and 
in Australia, they're selling for $300, which again makes them better value than the GeForce graphics cards. Yep. So, Dennis asks, if I want a B450 board, should I wait for the MSI Max boards or get one now? Because I hear many people have stability and other issues with the current B450 boards. Now, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think the stability problems would be resolved with a new uh, B450 revision. That would just be the BIOS version. They could easily improve stability on both the Max and non-Max versions. Yes. The yep. reason you get the Max is for the bigger BIOS chip, so the BIOS can have better compatibility. Well, it will be a it will be a physically different BIOS, yep. so you won't have. I, I believe the non-Max versions. Uh, because they're a 16 megabyte BIOS chip, they will always be limited to that light GS version, which has some features removed, some CPU compatibility removed. It's not an ideal situation. It's kind of hacking their gen Ryzen supporting. Whereas the Max will have a 32 megabyte BIOS and it will have your full UEFI BIOS with all your graphics and graphical user interface stuff. So yeah, they won't be the same version. So you may get better memory support and stuff like that. Not 100% sure, but in any case, I would 100% wait for the Max boards, and depending on who you speak to, yep. you may not have to wait at all. I don't know. <laughs> We're not quite sure on that one. Not quite sure on that one, but I would absolutely wait for the Max board, um, if, especially if you're buying new now, because uh, it'll be a lot better. Next one here, what would be proper upgrade for 6700K? So the Core i7 6700K, that is a Skylake part. Uh, I use my PC for gaming only. So well, that keeps hard, things simple. Dedicated gamer. Again, a big part of this is how much you would want to spend on an upgrade. It's always going to dictate what mm -hmm. you'd be thinking of. Um, you know, the 9900K, 3900X are going to be very decent upgrades for you. Yep. Um, you know, the 6700K, still pretty decent considering Skylake has been decent for games pretty much the entire generation. Yeah. It still is now. Well, it's but it's a quad core. Yeah, it's so, a, well, it's a 7700K. Yeah. And for the most part, the 7700K, while it is pretty well tapped out, is still performing quite well. Yeah. It's well, on the edge. There'll be a fall off in the next couple of years as we see more and more games utilised. Definitely. More than the, just the quad core. Yep. So maybe something like the 3700X would be good, considering it's a lot cheaper than the 9900K. I think it's probably a similar price to what you would have paid for the 6700K in you as yeah. well. So obviously you need a motherboard. Um, yeah, you have to get a motherboard either way, so... That's true, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, um, he'll be well aware of that. Uh, yeah, I think the 3700X is, is a good option there if you would yep. upgrade now. That's what I'd be getting. All right, got another question here on, do you think overclocking is now dead for NVIDIA and AMD CPUs and GPUs? We've sort of already covered that, but this next part's also quite interesting. How about the third-party cooling gear like water blocks all-in-one liquid coolers for CPU and GPU? Is it worth it anymore? Well, the first part, which we've already covered, yeah, is pretty well pointless at this point, Most, mostly pointless. Um, yeah, so I think we should probably get F for uh, F in <laughs> chat for the overclocking because yeah, yeah, definitely, we are we've decided it is dead. Uh, as for all in one liquid, well, so we got so the custom third party gear that's always been sort of niche. It's never really made sense in terms of, like yeah. stuff like that. It's it's it a lot. Awesome. It's a lot of fun. It looks awesome, and you really only do something like that if you've got money to burn. You've got, you've got the best of everything, and you're like, how can I throw more money at this to make it more epic? And that would be to do something like that. All-in-one liquid coolers, a bit more practical because they're significantly cheaper and quicker and easier to install. Uh, and the reason you would go for an all-in-one liquid cooler would be for improved, uh, again, you can wait how important these things are, improved compatibility with components such as memory modules. Um, th that is a thing, like big heat sinks can be a, a bit of a pain in the backside. They can, all be a, they can also be a really big pain in the backside when you have to work and get in around the CPU yeah, socket yep. area, like plug in an 8-pin connector or change something or maybe even change your memory. You've got to take that great big hunk of aluminium out and uh, yeah, it's it, with an all-in-one liquid cooler, you've got loads of room to work. Arguably, it looks nicer. I mean, some people may prefer the look of the affined heat sink. Uh, and uh, probably another big advantage would be you can dump the heat externally. So instead of having your radiator, uh, sorry, you, well, what would effectively be your radiator, your fin stack pushing you know, the heat out this way, which would mostly come out the exhaust, 
you can just have it right there at the exhaust so it's forced outside of the case so it, it can improve uh internal case temperatures um the big one for me is the noise well i wouldn't necessarily say like uh like a Corsair H115i Pro is any quieter or louder than a Noctua, you know, top-end cooler. Like yeah, I guess I was more thinking of sort of your mid-tier, like, air coolers, your sort of smaller, easier-to-use ones. I suppose, but... But it's not really the same price category. No, so. it's not really. Um, I don't think... I mean, they're definitely quiet, especially if you've got, like, yeah, a 240 millimeter radiator with two 120 millimeter fans. They obviously don't have to spin that hard, but you can get huge, huge heat sinks with two 120 millimeter fans as well. Uh, I think the main thing is you can you're more flexible in where you can direct and dump your heat. So that's that's obviously a big plus. You can just dump it straight outside the case, and compatibility, and arguably it looks better, depending yeah. on your depending on your cooler preference there. All right, this person is thinking about building a gaming PC soon. So should I bother with the i7-9700K or the 3700X when basically only gaming at 1440p, 144Hz with a 2070 Super slash 5700 XT? I'm worried about the headroom for the 16 threads compared to the 8 on the i7. What do you, what do you make of this? Uh, so this is why it's going to make me popular with part of the audience and not popular with the other part <laughs> uh, I think if you're building a new PC right now it's very similar to the conclusion I drew in the recent 9400F versus 3600 video so if you're building your PC now and you want it to last three years the concern you raise with the threads I think is a valid one and we've we've seen recently with like the R5 1600 outlasting the Core i5 7600K uh, doing much better in 2019. I think that'll be a case here. So I personally would get the 3700X. I think, especially right now, gaming at 1440p with, what was it? Uh, 2070 Super. Yeah, 2070 Super or, XT. or a 5700 XT. Yeah. There's no way you're going to notice a difference between the 9700K and the 3700X in the vast majority of games. Like, unless you're playing with, like, low quality settings and you're seeking, like, three, four, five hundred 500 frames per second... Uh, you won't notice a difference. So, yeah, I, I would be getting the 3700X for, yeah, the, the better platform support. You have more options to upgrade with. So if you buy yourself a 9700K, that's it. Like, you're not going to upgrade to a 9900K. Like, the changeover is just not worth it. It'd be very rare that that would make sense. But with a 3700X, you can get a 3900X, 3950X, or yep. possibly something else. All right. Uh, oh, logical as well. How many times has logical asked questions? It's all over the place. You get one, but we're gonna we'll let it slide for this one. Okay, and actually, I'm gonna hand this over to you anyway because this I see speculation <laughs> as the fourth word. So this is a Tim yeah, one. Okay. Yep. What is your speculation on when AMD will release a higher end Navi GPU? Will we see it launch slash announced before end of year? Well, last time we speculated about an AMD product getting launched at a certain time, that was the 3950X, and we were horribly wrong. <laughs> so we really don't know. Um, the the thing you sort of have to think is, has there been too many like credible-looking leaks and rumours about anything above the 5700 series at the moment? It doesn't seem like there's been too much. Mm. In fact, I would say there's been zero credible mm -hmm. sort of leaks and rumours. So that would suggest that it's at least... A fair way off. It's de it definitely seems like that sort of chip would be possible, mm -hmm. considering the current Navi dies are small, mm -hmm. um, only forty compute units, so they can obviously go, or at least they should be able to go higher than that. Um, it'd be great if it was this year, but you know, Nvidia's also got their seven slash eight or whatever nanometer chips they're going to go with. So it's a possibility as well that they would keep a fifty eight hundred series in the bank for you know if Nvidia launches something like that. Soon if we want it to happen this year, I'll guess Q1 next year. I think that's... And that'll bring it forward for us. <laughs> <laughs> Q1, I mean, possibly. I mean, it, it also depends, like, what is the sort of GPU design for the consoles as well? Because, mm -hmm. you know, if AMD is launching, say, a 60 or 80 compute unit part for, say, an Xbox console, um, then you could see that part also come across to the PC at the same time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, just... Just depends. I think Navi will be around for a while, though, for at least a few years. So little to have, Navi. To have 
a, you know, a range of series still ready oh, yeah. to go, 5,800, 5,600 yeah, yeah, yep. over the next you know couple of years will be will be possible. Yeah, obviously we can really only guess um, and we're not very good at it. So <laughs> when we were working out, we were di- when we were discussing uh, privately the 16 core part, we were throwing back and forth all the potential options. And I said to Tim, what if in a week's time, this is when we were at Computex, so E3 was a week later, what if in a week's time they, they saved this announcement for E3? And Tim was like, that would be the dumbest thing to do. And I'm like, yeah, I know it would be, but let's discuss the options. And so we discussed that and we both agreed that would be the least likely and dumbest thing for AMT to, AMD yeah, to do. I, know. I remember us both clearly yeah, saying yeah, that would yeah. be the dumbest and least likely option. We had a list of like 10 things. Yeah, we put out, we did like pros and cons for each of yeah. the methods that we came up with. And like, oh, there's not very many pros in the launching it soon option. And they go and launch it soon. So. And they go and, do, they go and yeah. do the least likely thing we thought. So. Yeah, we're hopeless at that, I yeah. guess. Stick to our testing monitors and benchmarking, CPUs and GPUs. And getting to the next question. And the next question is, why has AMD and in past NVIDIA used blower-style coolers? It's a good one because we've seen with the 5700 series that the blower kind of sucks. Yeah, well, I've asked AMD this directly multiple times, and they say it's meant to be a reference card. That's why it's called an AMD reference card. So it's it's a point of reference for their AIBs and for OEMs and whatnot. And the reason it's a blower is because... That works best in OEM PCs, apparently, even though it's sort of yeah. been proven that it doesn't. Well, we do see that for some reason, o- when the OEMs come to designing their own GPUs like HP or whatever mm-hmm. for their pre-builds, they almost always use the, the blower for whatever reason. Yeah, so. they'll run like crap. Yeah, they'll run They're like crap. They're always loud and hot. Must Maybe it's cheaper to make that sort of cool. Uh, yeah, I'm in a bit of a loss because we've seen a few different media outlets now get small form factor PCs, like very, very compact, slim yep. form factor PCs. And they've put in like dual axial fans in there with, and then and then a blower type thing. And it's always been louder and hotter. So I don't really get it. All I can tell you is what AMD tells us and that it's meant to be a reference card. And that's... I mean, when you look inside the cooler of the Navi GPUs, there's not a lot of heatsink there compared to what you'd normally see from. Yeah, it's because the, the open... fan takes up like thirty, forty. But that of the is going to reduce the cost of making the cooler. Sure. So potentially that is why they would do it. Is yeah, but they have to add heat? a lot more copper. Like they're quite heavy, the coolers. Like they have to add mm. a lot more copper than having a, a denser fin stack out of aluminium. So I'd be interested to know what the pricing is for those two sort of designs. Yeah, I, I honestly would have thought that the heat sinks they use would be more expensive. Hmm, I would have thought that the, the but, open air ones are more expensive, but you never know. Yeah, uh, well, maybe, yeah. Don't know, don't know. We'll look into that. Well, yeah, well, we'll try to. Okay, got a long question here. Hopefully I can make it through. Do you think the whole super lineup from NVIDIA was an, un- an unnecessary and a trust breach. NVIDIA always has an upgrade cycle of two years, but this year they made upgrades to the vanilla 20 series cards in a year at the same price point. They also made the older cards obsolete and dropped support for them. How much of this is fair to consumers as RTX 2080, 2070 is still on par with 1080 Ti. Generation improvement has also dropped with the price to performance. Um, I don't think they've actually dropped support. They the haven't. cards are still supported, they're just they're not, supported. they're not selling them anymore. Yeah, um, they're definitely supported still. And I don't think it's a trust of breach on any front. Like, they don't have too many options. So they're limited by what is available, what tech's available to them, uh, the process yep. node they have available. And they have big, complex... GPU, so going to seven nanometer at this point in time isn't an option because seven nanometers is horribly expensive and that would just eat into their margins massively. And we know Nvidia is all about margins. So yep. I think as well, like there w- there was a time when the upgrade cycle wasn't two years, wasn't it? There a while ago, like we're talking they, ten years ago. They got stuck on twenty eight nanometer, I think it was. Yeah, it's, I should know because I wrote about it a million and one times. But yes, they there was a refresh or a refresh or a refresh, basically, and AMD did the same thing. I think AMD did it more than... Because uh, there, there, was, there was definitely a time when we were getting, you know, around that, you know, 
HD 4000, 5000 series time, they yep. seemed like they were pretty regular, like yep. not as big upgrades as, say, your Pascal to Turing type upgrades, but certainly there were... That's why Pascal was so upgrade. amazing. Yeah. Because we were waiting for a big step forward. And Maxwell was pretty good. Yeah, but and then, then Pascal, Pascal came and went huge. back. You're not going to get that all the time. And, you know, it's... Sure, the supercards are disappointing because the performance upgrade isn't that much. But it, in a year, they've been able to add a little bit more performance. The price is the same. I mean, that's a stock standard-ish upgrade that we're getting these days. Like, we're not in the, we're really not in the point anymore where we can realistically get thirty percent performance improvements every year. Yeah. So if a company like Nvidia decides that they want to release a new range of GPUs after one year, then getting your five to ten percent performance gains is really what we're looking like. We saw the same with AMD with their Zen Zen Plus. Zen Plus was like five to ten percent faster. So yeah. I well. Yeah, that's true. I will say, though, that, yeah, I, I find it somewhat unnecessary because there was no adjustment to pricing made. Well, no real significant pricing adjustment. I think because they thought it was faster. Yeah, but it's just... Well, yeah, I mean, you're getting a tiny bit more at the same price. I think the worst thing about the whole thing is that it's not that this, the super cards are a little bit faster than the previous cards, is that... The 1080 Ti isn't was like the same price and performance as basically as the 2080 Super. Yeah. Like it's not. Well, the 2080 Super is the first one to actually make a step forward from the 1080 Ti, and yeah. it's a tiny one. Well, that's what I think. That is the main problem. The, from Pascal to now, there hasn't been too much of an upgrade. If if you got like the the 2080 was a lot faster than the 1080 Ti, and now they've made it just a little bit faster, you'd be like, eh, all right, it's one year later. It hasn't been that much of an upgrade, but it's a year later, was really the 2080 Super is like, what, what did you say in your review? Was it two and a half years two on half from years, the 1080i? Yeah, that is the disappointing thing Yeah, with yep. the with the launch there. Definitely. So, yeah. Dalton P asks, DDR4 3200CL14 versus DDR4 3600CL16-17. Uh, right. So I covered this in the day one. Yeah, it was the day one Zen 2 review. So... Uh, short answer, bugger all difference. They're basically the same. So either will work. A personal question. We know you guys love PC gaming, but what games do you play regularly? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm not a person. I don't just sit and play one game all the time. We've talked about this a fair few times. Yeah, we have. I just play, you know, your standard sort of AAA games that are sort of the latest titles, a few indie games I throw in there from time to time. I do a bit of console gaming. Just whatever's the latest stuff, I usually play through it. If it's single player, play through it, move on to the next thing. Or if it's multiplayer, play a little bit, get sick of it after like 30 to 50 hours. And yeah, I cycle a lot through things. Yeah, I'm not a big gamer. We've talked about this in the past. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love computer games. I'm not a big gamer in the sense that I play a lot of games. So... I play, um, and I really like real-time strategy games, so your RTS title. So I played StarCraft 2, and that came out a lot. Played that for, like, five years. I still come back to it every now and then, see what the multiplayer scenes like, jump in there and have a few rounds. Uh, but recently I've been playing a lot of Fortnite. So I think it's a bit of fun. The reason I've been playing it is because my six-year-old daughter absolutely loves it, so I have a game with her each night, and she's getting pretty good at it. So, yeah. That's pretty much nice. my PC gaming time is playing Fortnite with my daughter. Uh, but yeah, we have a lot of fun. It's it's pretty good fun. It's, they do a good job with that game, I reckon. It's always evolving and changing. They're adding new content. Yeah, it's a um, bit of fun. And I find it, like, I used to play a lot of Quake Rocket Arena back in the day. I've played a lot of the Call of Duty stuff. A little bit of Battlefield, but more sort of Call of Duty uh, side of things when it was good back in the... The original first few, the original Modern Warfare was awesome. Yeah, Modern Warfare time is good. So I spent a lot of time playing those games. So I'm pretty good at shooters, but it's taken me quite a while to wrap my head around Fortnite, just the building element of it. Now I love it. It's it's really challenging, a lot of fun. I know there'll be a lot of guys thinking, oh my God, I hate Fortnite. I can't believe you're talking about it. But uh, I think it's a bit of fun. So anyway. All right, next question. Test the new Zen 2 CPUs in eSport games like CSGO and League of Legends. AMD promised 30 plus more FPS in these games. Is that over there older CPUs? I don't really... Do you remember I mean, that I mean, it slide? must be. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I compared the 3900X against the 9900K in CSGO, and the Ryzen CPU was actually a little bit faster. I mean, you're talking like, I think it was 515 <laughs> frames to 530 or something. Uh, and yeah, I get requests all the time to test like Dota 2 and League of Legends. I know they're massively popular, but guys, I could drop my smartphone in my toaster and all run it. Like, seriously, testing a 1900K and a 3900X in League of Legends or Rocket League, it's like, yeah, you get a million frames a second. Next. Like, it's just, it's a complete waste yep. of time. Adam asks, about your video on the Ryzen 3900X with a B350 board, I was wondering if there is any point on buying a new B550 board when it comes out over a secondhand B350 slash 450 with the new Ryzen 5 3600, because it seems to me that there is almost no difference between them. Thanks for all the hard work you guys are doing. Love watching your content. Well, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's another one of those ones that's pretty hard to say at this point. We are expecting B550 boards. Uh, I think we're expecting them early next year. That's all reports that I've seen. We're yep. also expecting them to skip PCIe 4.0. But again, take both of those things with a grain of salt because we don't actually know until we get them, or at least some official word from AMD. Well, th the theory was that a lot of the reason X570 boards are more expensive than the last generation was because of integrating support for PCI 4.0. And we talked about this back at Combitex. Yeah, so um, it'd be kind of surprising to put PCI 4.0 and B550. B550? Yeah, B550. Because then what would be the difference between B550 and X570? Yeah, nothing. And also it would increase the price of be, the yeah. budget board. So I think it, it's... It stands to reason that they'll have PCIe 3.0. It'll basically just be a modern B450. Yeah, they'll be like bigger. It'll be like the Mac series from it, MSI. Pretty much. It'll have native third gen support. It might be a bit better memory support, that sort of thing. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, not that that matters. <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, if you really want to build now, I would probably get like one of MSI's B450 Max boards if they're available. I don't know. Or wait for B550 because we don't really know what that's going to bring. Hey guys, quick question. Why is there no Samsung display reviews on the channel? Are you not getting review samples or is Samsung not that big down under? I would love to see a review on quantum dot technology and the performance of Samsung monitors in general. Love your work. Why do we not have Samsung reviews, Tim? Tell me. Uh, well, basically because uh, they are not super helpful with getting review samples in Australia. Um, you know, we've been working to get basically every major monitor manufacturer to, you know, help work with us with reviews and samples. And so far, we've been able to get pretty much all of them, including a lot of the, the minor ones. We do a lot of Viotech and Pixio mm -hmm. and stuff. We've just recently started doing LG monitor reviews. Obviously, LG is a massive manufacturer. We cover all the standard ones from companies we work with on motherboards, like your ASUS's and all that. So we cover all most of them. Samsung, though... Um, Still eludes Tim. Yeah, it'll, I mean, there's been sort of... The issue that we have with Samsung, not just from, you know, obviously trying to work with them, it's been a little bit difficult, but they also have a very different release schedule here to uh, in other countries. So often a product that's released you know, early in, say, the US can take several months to get here in terms of monitors, and which point, you know... Uh, for example, the one that we get a lot, I've got a lot of requests for is the 49 inch ult, big ultra wide, the, I believe it's like a 1440p class high refresh ultra wide. The, it's got a terrible product name that I forget, but we, I've got a lot of requests for that. It's, just, it's not available here yet. Mm -hmm. So, we, so at, and at least at the time, a lot of people are asking me it wasn't available where it was available in other regions. So we sort of, yeah, Samsung is just a bit of a mess here. I would love to review their monitors in particular. But as well, you know, Samsung makes a lot of panels. You asked about quantum dot technology. That's already available in other monitors. It's not a Samsung exclusive thing um, that we've already looked at. It's quite good. So, yeah, I'd love to look at Samsung. They're the kind of the final company that we have to check off before we've I've reviewed pretty much all the major companies. So Yeah, well, you'd absolutely love to cover them. And it's not... You're not sort of putting your foot down and go, well, if they're not going to give us samples, we're never going to cover them. It's definitely not that. It's more what Tim's saying, that we the way they release things. And once it comes to Australia, there's not much point us then investing a huge amount of money to get this one product for review that a small portion of our audience is interested in and other people have reviewed it 
three, four, five, six months already. Because pretty much most companies these days do release their products at a very similar time. And in in the case of, say, LG, which might be a bit more delayed here, we just get them straight from Korea. So, But Samsung are very adamant about making sure that their monitors are available in Australia before we test them because we're in an Australian publication according to them so yeah um yeah that just presents a bit of an issue definitely and um we'd love to work with samsung samsung if you're watching this video reach out send your monitors over but we'll we'll do we'll do we'll put in some more effort in there and see what we can do yeah last question for our regular q a section do you believe scott herkelman from amd when he says that uh rtg slash amd had planned a price drop after nvidia's supercards as a jabate <laughs> Uh, no, I think they're full of it when they say that that was fully planned uh, and a well-executed ruse on their behalf. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, AMD knows the pricing that they want to achieve and they know what their cards cost to manufacture and sort of what the lowest point they can sell is. And they're constantly you know, assessing the market. Yeah. So right before launch, new cards come out. They've got to reassess the market and pricing. They've got to change the price. And, you know, it's not a case where the original price was going to be a scam or misleading or anything. You know, that they always are going to try and sell it as, as high as they possibly can while still being an option that people are actually going to buy. That's just how markets work. They always try and sell it for the best possible price for them. And that it, that pricing they launched with wasn't the best possible yeah, price. It, was a late it wasn't going to work. It was very obviously yeah. a last minute reaction. A, yeah. a, a late decision. It wasn't going to work. So They clearly had all the pricing. Well, they announced it. And if that is true, AMD are just assets. I'm going to say that now. <laughs> I'm going to use that language and say that because they pretty much screwed the majority of reviewers with that launch. Because not only did they dump Zen 2 on us and Navi at the same time, but a lot of people would have got their Navi testing out of the way, got their review done in the week they had, if they had a week, and then switched over to Zen 2, which is what we did. And you've got your content. And, like, ch- a price change is massive. Like, we had to change, like, 60% of our review. And even then, people were complaining because we, for our commentary on the benchmark graphs, we were comparing, we were talking about the wrong cards. And that's because they changed the price last minute. So then I had to go back and redo all our cost per frame stuff, our overall uh, breakdown, and then the full conclusion. <clears throat> and AMD didn't tell us till the Friday, or was it? I think it, it was, was very... Uh, yeah. yeah, it was like weekend before type yeah. stuff. So it was... People just had days to redo everything. I know Linus was complaining about having to get all his staff to come in on the weekend because they'd already done it. So it was just... They made what was already becoming a messy launch way worse by doing that. So if this was if if they had baited Nvidia Nvidia had already made the commitment they had already released the super products at the price so at that point the, before reviewers even got samples they could have been made aware of the price drop yep because it doesn't matter if that information leaks because then what's Nvidia going to do release the prices again and then AMD updates their pricing and before you know it GPUs are free like it made no sense. They're they're lying big time on that one because it just doesn't yeah. make any sense. No, they wouldn't have done it. No. All right. That is all the questions that we have time to cover in July or that we want to cover for this yeah. month. There's 180 certainly... to go. Yeah. You guys are just asking at least more questions Which is good. than ever before. So, yeah, we love you guys who do put the questions in the YouTube channel and on the Discord for our Patreons. I think we'll be doing a Patreon episode after this one. Mm-hmm. So make sure... Yeah, there's some good questions in there as well. So everyone will be able to watch that. Uh, that'll be up on the channel soon. What else do we normally say at the end of this stuff? Subscribe. We really Definitely appreciate subscribe. that. Become a Patreon member so you mm-hmm. can ask the Patreon questions that we will cover. Um, we've got our live streams there as well. It's a not- nice place to be on the Patreon at the moment. Yeah. Um, like awesome. the video. That makes us feel good on the inside. So <laughs> love a bit of the like action. And I guess, yeah, we'll catch you in the next one. <laughs>